Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. A new Project Veritas video shows men outside a polling station campaigning for Democrats in Pennsylvania. Is it legal there? Election officials in Arizona and Nevada say they need several more days to finish counting all their ballots. This comes amid concerns over tabulators that malfunctioned in Arizona's most populous county. Both Senate candidates are going all in to try to win the high-stakes Georgia runoff election. And one candidate has already taken an early lead in raising campaign funds. We take the pulse of the nation and its media. What a speechwriter for former President Trump has to say about the midterm results. And the Indian Child Welfare Act is under fire in front of the Supreme Court this week. We speak with a legal expert who argues that the act is race-based. John Fetterman and Josh Shapiro have won Pennsylvania's Senate and governor's races. But an undercover video raises concerns about possible illegal campaigning for Democratic candidates at a Philadelphia polling center. NTD's Arlene Richards reports. Project Veritas, a nonprofit organization that investigates and exposes corruption, has a new video. It shows men at the entrance of a Philadelphia polling center on Election Day providing information on Democratic candidates. Anyone need Democratic Party information? You good? So you, you're uh, telling me I should vote John Fetterman, I should vote Joshua if Shapiro? You vote that, Democratic, that'll make... All of them are the Democrats. You only got one against one. The video, posted on founder James O'Keefe's Instagram account, shows one man saying this. I know, I think you're Democratic. Oh, you got it. Okay. You see uh, that one. If you're Democrat, for the, for the common man, or just the guy that got a lot of money, you want some tax shelter. That's, that's the way to go. <laughs> Flyers for Democratic candidates were posted at the door. O'Keefe said the men were engaging in illegal electioneering. What is electioneering? It means to actively campaign on behalf of one party. So what's illegal about that? Pennsylvania law requires all persons to remain at least 10 feet distant from the polling place during the progress of voting. There are exceptions for persons lawfully giving assistance to voters, such as election officers, clerks, and machine inspectors. But it's not clear if these men fit the exceptions. What do you do, Rudy? Do you just do you work here? Or do you... I'm a committee person. Are you, do you work with the, with the office here? I'm a committee person. Philadelphia okay. County has a guide that details key items the law says shouldn't be happening outside of polling places. For example, handing out campaign materials and telling voters which candidates to support. In another Veritas video, a Chinese translator who works for the election board also favors Democrats. I, I asked you to vote the Republican. I mean the Democrats down there. Meanwhile, over at a ballot box near a Philadelphia elections office. I'm going to talk to someone that works at the Board of Elections and let them know these keys are here. They're obviously some sort of elections keys. Uh, basically, I, I came around the block and I realized that there's a set of keys on top of this ballot box. Arlene Richards, NTD News, New York. Officials in Arizona's Maricopa County are explaining what went wrong with their tabulators on Election Day. They say the machines malfunctioned because printer settings were wrong. And the county needs at least until next week to finish counting all the ballots. During the Tuesday elections, tabulators at 70 polling sites in Maricopa County malfunctioned. The tabulators were unable to read some of the ballots because the printers did not produce dark enough timing marks on ballots. This impacted around 20 percent of polling sites in Arizona's most populous county. Voters at those locations were asked to place their ballots in a separate box on site instead. We have about 7 percent of the total of in-person ballots yesterday that went into box three. So that seven, 17,000 ballots is about 7 percent. The Maricopa County Board of Supervisors issued a statement Wednesday explaining why the machines malfunctioned. They said the problem was with faulty printer settings. Board Chairman Bill Gates and Vice Chairman Clint Hickwood said, quote, the printer settings for the ballot-on-demand printers at vote centers were the same ones we used in the August primary. The paper was the same thickness. What happened yesterday, uh, we cannot have a repeat of. We are already looking very closely at what happened. Obviously, our team was able to come up with a fix yesterday for what happened, so that allowed those vote centers to get back online. 
Maricopa County officials said that they test printed and test tabulated hundreds of ballots without issue before the general election. They added that they are trying to find out what changed. The county board also said, quote, once we get through this election, we are committed to finding the root cause of the issue so that it does not happen again. Gates said on CNN Thursday that they have around 400,000 ballots left to count. We will be going into next week. There's some onesie twosies, uh, again, pursuant to Arizona law. But I think that we'll see the lion's share here wrap up by early next week. The Senate and the gubernatorial races in Arizona are still too close to call as of Thursday evening. Reporting by Allison Lee, NTD News. And Nevada will also need more time to count their ballots. Election officials in Clarks County, the state's most populous county, said today that they still have around 50,000 ballots to go. They added that it will take three days to get the ballots into the system. The race for governor and for U.S. Senate are still too close to call. With roughly 91 percent of the votes in, Republicans are leading both races. And the runoff election for the U.S. Senate seat in Georgia is just four weeks away, and both candidates have already received millions of dollars in campaign funds. The stakes are high, as this race could determine which party takes control of the Senate. NTD's Jason Perry has that story. And I did warn y'all that we might be spending Thanksgiving together. Senator Raphael Warnock didn't waste much time before getting back on the campaign trail for Georgia's Senate runoff election. Let's win this thing one more time. Let's build a Georgia that embraces all of our children. Let's get it done. The Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee has announced it will spend $7 million to help the Warnock campaign. The money will fund direct voter contact programs that will reach Georgians at their doors. Republican candidate Herschel Walker said this on Fox News. Now, they're trying to buy this seat. They're going to do everything they can to buy this seat. So I'm going to need your help, everyone out there help to say, hey, guys, we're not going to let them buy this seat. According to Fox News, Walker's campaign has received about $4 million since the runoff election was announced on Wednesday. Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, who was just reelected, shared his experience with runoff elections. I was in a runoff four years ago and I prevailed on that. It's really who gets the pe most people out, who has the most uh, you know, active campaign. And I know I traveled all over the state in my uh, runoff period, and I'm sure that both campaigns will be doing that. As Walker and Warnock campaign for their second time in this election cycle, votes are still being counted in Nevada and Arizona. If either party, Republican or Democrat, wins both of those Senate races, that party will take control of the Senate. But if the Arizona and Nevada Senate races split between the parties, control of the Senate will come down to the winner of the Georgia runoff election. Jason Perry, NTD News. And in Colorado, Representative Lauren Boebert took the lead in her race for re-election today. She's now ahead of Democrat Adam Frisch by about 450 votes, according to unofficial results from Colorado Secretary of State Jenna Griswold. Decision Desk reports her up by about 790 votes. Boebert, a strong supporter of former President Trump, is seeking a second term. Frisch was ahead by just 64 votes late yesterday. And as votes continue being counted in some key midterm races, we take a step back and look at what the coverage of the results tells us about the country's media and where things stand with former President Trump. Earlier today, I heard from Darren Beatty, a journalist at Revolver News and a former White House speechwriter for Trump, for his perspective. Darren Beatty, welcome to our show. Thanks so much for joining us. Fantastic to be here. Thanks for having me. Now, the expected red wave did not happen as Republicans had hoped it would, but the GOP has made some significant gains in states and localities nationwide, including state Supreme Court judges, school boards, and state legislatures. What do you think these gains signal about voter sentiment? Well, I think voter sentiment is a mixed bag, but you're absolutely right. It is not the disaster that's been widely reported in certain quarters of the media. It wasn't the tsunami that was hyped up in the weeks and months leading up to the election day, but really it's still a very live possibility to take both the House and the Senate, depending on how um, Nevada, Arizona uh, play out. It's still 
probably more likely than not that Kerry Lake will be governor of Arizona. And so I think the voter sentiment uh, is a mixed bag, but nothing to scoff at from the Republican standpoint. And 17 Trump-backed Senate candidates won in the midterms. But reporting has tended to focus on the Trump-backed candidates who lost. A number of commentators on both the left and right are also blaming Trump for those Republican losses. What's your take on that? I think it's a foolish narrative uh, for most of those purveying it, and it's a malicious narrative for those who've been seeding it. I mean, it's no secret in American politics that there are a certain element of the establishment and consultant class that's wanted to get rid of Trump since he appeared on the national stage. And they're smart enough to understand that we can't go back to self-identified establishment candidates. And so their next best bet is what they call Trumpism after Trump. And so they think the most efficient way to materialize this is to falsely blame uh, Trump for the, again, not disastrous, but perhaps underwhelming results of uh, of the other day, of the midterm day, uh, which I think is um, really simply mistaken from an analytical point of view. And what do you think accounts for the large number of conservative-leaning media outlets and commentators going after Trump in this way? Well, anybody who has lived through the year 2015, I was one of the lone Trump supporters in July of 2015, and I can tell you that the most vigorous and hostile opposition I received for supporting Trump that early on in the primary stage did not come from the left. It came from people who make a living off of conservatism. That has never changed. These scam artists and scumbags and mediocre grifters who make a living off of politics in this fashion, cozied up to Trump after he was a foregone conclusion, but never reconciled with him. And the knife has always been ready for the appropriate moment to stab him in the back, and the knives are out right now. But I think we've learned at this point that you never underestimate Trump, and I think he's more than prepared for uh, the betrayal that is emerging from certain quarters of the conservative establishment. Do you think Republicans are at a crossroads in terms of the future of the party and its leader? I don't know about crossroads. I think uh, it's a bit premature to say that. I think to some extent the whole sort of civil war narrative or Trump versus DeSantis thing is overblown and amplified by people who just want to stir up trouble. I think that most Republican voters love DeSantis as they should and they love Trump and they understand that while DeSantis is an excellent governor, um, he's perhaps not ready for the national stage on which Trump has proven himself. And they're more than happy, especially Floridians such as myself, we're more than happy to treat ourselves to DeSantis's excellent leadership here in Florida for a little bit more. And then uh, he can run for president um, perhaps in uh, 2028. Now, you said that if Trump decides to make a comeback, he should be selective about the outlets he interviews with and resurrect the spirit of 2015 by going scorched earth mode. Could you elaborate on that? Well, it's the first one, it's been a source of frustration. I'm very grateful that he does endorse and promote my news outlet, Revolver.News, and we've always been very supportive of him. But it is kind of frustrating to see someone like Trump, who has killer instincts and on certain level knows you reward friends and you punish enemies doing interviews and exclusives with news organizations that simply hate him. And in many ways, it's one thing with the New York Times that already has, you know, a certain kind of uh, reputation, but for conservative outlets that rely on him for views and for clout for him to simply give them that imprimatur when they attack him at the earliest opportunity. I think he needs to get a little bit more um, more ruthless in that regard and say, look, for the people who betray me, I'm not going to let you make a living off of me. And uh, as for scorched earth, that's a much uh, broader um, uh, 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 issue. And I think, again, you know, he's 
he had that killer instinct 2015 2016 he shocked the american political establishment he ran against and he earned the coordinated opposition of every single powerful corrupt institution of this country and he beat them and i think over time it's fair to say all of his successes notwithstanding he did merge with the establishment to agree that was perhaps um, inadvisable in retrospect. And I was simply calling for him to resurrect, uh, resurrect that killer that we all saw in 2015 and 2016 that shocked the nation and made every single corrupt consultant who comprises what we now call the swamp wet their pants in fear that they were not going to be able to cash their checks off the backs and the misery of the American people anymore. Much to think about there. Thank you so much, Darren Beatty, founder and editor at Revolver, New Revolver News. Great to be here. As the number of Republican House wins is rising, a House committee submitted a brief today that urges the Supreme Court to release former President Trump's tax returns. The House Ways and Means Committee is concerned that without the records, it won't be able to complete its legislative work before this term ends in January 2023. If Republicans take a majority in the House, the request would most likely be dropped when the new Congress is seated. The Treasury Department was temporarily blocked from giving the returns to the committee. The question currently before the High Court is whether or not to extend the delay. And a follow-up on a story from last night. The Supreme Court yesterday heard arguments against the controversial Indian Child Welfare Act. Today, we hear from one of the parties involved who spoke with our reporter. The Indian Child Welfare Act, or ICWA, says that children who are up for adoption and have the slightest trace of Indian blood should be placed under tribal custody instead of with a non-Indian family. It was passed in the 70s with the intention to preserve Native American culture. NTD spoke with Timothy Sandifer from the Goldwater Institute, who presented oral arguments against ICWA at the U.S. Supreme Court this week. Sandifer says that ICWA plays out in very strange ways in practice. For example, when children with a trace of Native blood can't get adopted by non-Native parents, even if the birth parents are Native Americans and want the child to get adopted by non-Native Americans. The mother was Navajo and the father's Cherokee. They chose to place their child with the Brackeen family, and they selected them to adopt their child, which, if they were of any other race, a court would have automatically approved. But because they're eligible for, because a child is eligible for member in an Indian tribe, ICWA allows the tribal government to veto that choice, and that's what happened. Navajo politicians decided to block the birth parents' decision to place their child with the Brackeens and order that the child be sent to live with strangers in a different state instead. Another example he gave is when a mother who's a tribe member sought to terminate the parental rights with her ex-husband who was criminal, abusive, and imprisoned. Nevertheless, the Washington State Supreme Court said that ICWA applied and prohibited her from doing that. That's only one of many cases in which Indian parents who have sought to terminate the rights of abusive or neglectful ex-spouses have been prohibited from doing so under ICWA, which would never happen if the parents or the children were white or black or Asian or any other race. The petitioners in the Supreme Court case are now trying to establish that ICWA is a race-based law, which would most likely make it unconstitutional. Sandifer says they're not expecting the Supreme Court to make any decision on the case until June of next year. Reporting by Arian Pastar, NTD News. Tragedy in Florida. At least two people are dead after Hurricane Nicole makes landfall. It's the first hurricane to hit the U.S. in November in almost 40 years. Nicole weakened to a tropical storm after making landfall as a hurricane. Two people died when they were electrocuted by a downed power line in Orange County, Florida. In Volusia County, officials say multiple coastal homes have been collapsed and several other properties are at imminent risk. That's in places where Hurricane Ian washed away the beach and destroyed seawalls only weeks ago. A tornado threat plus powerful winds and heavy rains are expected to continue today in parts of Florida, Georgia and South Carolina. Nicole is expected to dump lots of rain over a large area of the southeastern U.S. with up to six inches falling over the Blue Ridge Mountains. 
And be sure to reach out with news tips or feedback for our show if you have any. You can email us at eveningnews at ntd.com. And still to come, Ukrainian troops advanced further south and recaptured more than 10 settlements after Russia announced its withdrawal from Kherson, the only regional capital that it captured. And in football news, the Washington commanders are in trouble again. This time, though, the league may be in hot water as well. NTD's Dave Martin has the story. That and more coming up. Did you know dragging chains can spark a wildfire? Only you can prevent wildfires. Navigating a world of economic madness, you need to have the right guide. What do today's decisions mean for your tomorrow? We ask why, what's the alternative? Uncover the deeper reasons and the hidden influences and highlight the real opportunities for profit. At Entity Business, we connect the dots for you. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Entity Business, I'm Paul Ukrainian troops advanced in the south today after Moscow ordered one of the war's biggest retreats, leaving the city of Kherson. But Kyiv remained wary, warning that fleeing Russians could turn Kherson into what they call a city of death. Ukraine's army chief said on Thursday that Ukrainian troops had advanced four miles and recaptured 12 settlements after Russia announced its withdrawal from the southern city of Kherson. Ukraine's state TV showed a small group of Ukrainian soldiers being greeted by residents in a retaken village around 30 miles north of Kherson. <laughs> Moscow ordered its troops on Wednesday to withdraw from the entire Russian-held pocket on the west bank of the Dnipro River, including Kherson city. I understand that this is a very difficult decision. At the same time, we will save, most importantly, the lives of our troops and the overall combat effectiveness of the troops. Kiev has so far mostly been wary in public, warning that Russians may still be planning to sow destruction on their way out. But you need to understand, no one just goes anywhere if they do not feel strong. The enemy does not give us gifts, does not make gestures of goodwill. Kherson is the only regional capital Russia had captured in the nine months of war. The abandonment of such a strategic prize would be a major setback for Moscow. And Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, estimates that well over 100,000 Russian soldiers and a similar number of Ukrainian troops have been killed or wounded in the war, and around 40,000 civilians have died. He says a potential stalemate in fighting over the winter could provide both countries an opportunity to negotiate peace, but the Ukrainian government said Russia must first return all of Ukraine's occupied lands, provide compensation for war damage, and face prosecution for war crimes. And now, over to sports news. Here's NTD's Dave Martin with today's top stories. The Washington commanders are in some more trouble but they have some company this time. Washington, D.C. Attorney General Carl Racine says his office is filing a civil consumer protection lawsuit against the commanders and owner Daniel Snyder, as well as the NFL and Commissioner Roger Goodell. Racine said the franchise and the league colluded to deceive D.C. residents about an investigation into the team's workplace environment. A year ago, the commanders were fined $10 million by the NFL for having a toxic workplace culture, but the results of the investigation were never made public. At the time, lawyers representing the employees slammed the league for allegedly protecting Snyder and not releasing the findings. Racine made the announcement with several posters flanking him. One of them read, quote, Dan Snyder assured fans that he would fully cooperate with the investigation and the results could be trusted. 
That was a lie. He repeatedly attempted to interfere, and the fans could not trust results that were never made public because Snyder had a veto. Another sign said that Snyder's alleged lies impacted consumer spending decisions. The commanders are already under investigation by the attorneys general of D.C. and Virginia, Congress, and now a second one by the NFL for a variety of allegations. A spokesperson for the team says they've cooperated in the attorneys general's investigation for nearly a year. And tonight in the NBA, a quadruple header is on tap featuring the Portland Trail Blazers, who have the third best record in the league, taking on Zion Williamson and the Pelicans. Meanwhile, in the NHL, 20 teams are in action this evening, including the surprising New Jersey Devils hosting the Ottawa Senators. And finally, for you NFL fans, the Panthers host the Falcons on Thursday Night Football. And that's a wrap for sports. Back to you, Steph. Thanks, Dave. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. Until next time, I'm Stephanie Cox. Good night. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.